Dark energy is one of those complicated areas of physics that are dragged into the limelight by science fiction and then brutally misinterpreted. Depending on the story, dark energy might provide fuel for a spaceship, it might form a currency or even become a source of food. But the reality is far stranger and because it's based in fact, far more profound. In this video, we'll cut through the tangle of science fiction to the core of what dark energy really is. And the best way to do this is actually to tell a story. It's the story behind its proposal and later discovery. It's the story of Einstein's biggest mistake, of Gnab Gnibs, of ever accelerating stones, and of a stubbornly expanding universe. Enjoy. In the winter of 1915, Albert Einstein published his General Theory of Relativity, and in it he described a phenomena. The force we experience as gravity is nothing more than a complicated bending of space-time. With staggering applications and predictions, Einstein's model of gravity became his most celebrated work. But with it came a burning question Einstein found he couldn't ignore. If gravity pulls matter together, and the universe has been around for a really long time, which indeed it has, why hasn't all the matter in the universe long ago condensed into one big star-like ball of fusing matter? On the small scale, this is exactly what happens. Matter condenses, it forms stars and planets and moons and, and you and me and computers. But on the large scale, when we zoom out, galaxies tend to be generally unmoving and distant relative to one another. To explain why matter behaves differently on the cosmic scale than it does to everyday life, Einstein proposed a radical new concept, something he was getting quite good at. 11 years earlier, he'd broken space and time with his special relativity. Now, though, he proposed that space has a kind of built-in property, a sort of stretchiness that works to oppose gravity. He termed it the cosmological constant, and he was clear to stress that it was not a new force, but merely a property of space. Imagine trying to stretch or compress a perfect vacuum and finding that space itself pushes back to keep the vacuum unchanged. This is like saying that there's some property called the glasses constant and when you try and stretch or compress the glasses it works against you to ensure the glasses stay well. Glasses. In this way Einstein gave no explanation of what causes the cosmological constant but it came as a result of his field equation which in all its glory is. For now, we don't need to know what every symbol means, only that the entire equation describes how space-time curves under mass and energy. It involves tensors, which are like the meaner, bigger brother of scalars and vectors. Tensors are notoriously difficult, and tensor calculus, which is what this equation uses, took Einstein about a decade to understand. No wonder we won't cover it in this video. To Einstein, the universe was static. It neither expanded or contracted. It remained the same size. To account for this, he included the cosmological constant within his equations. And by fine-tuning the value of lambda, that's the symbol for it, he could produce a static universe. He balanced the inward pull of gravity with the outward expansion, the outward pushing power of the cosmological constant to produce a static, unchanging universe. Although the maths of this was sound, Edwin Hubble showed in 1929 that the universe was actually expanding. A static universe model was no longer needed, and the field equation no longer needed a value of lambda to keep it stable. Einstein scrapped it, calling it his biggest blunder. When the results of Hubble's work were published, the Einstein naysayers, and there were a lot of them, had a field day. Their argument went like this. The obvious answer to why the galaxies are so spread out is that the Big Bang caused all of matter to be flung far and wide, and over the last 13.8 billion years, gravity has been slowly working to pull it all back together. Over a huge time period, and indeed it would have to be huge if 13.8 billion years isn't long enough, gravity would win and all the matter would be contracted back together. But as it stands right now, it's still expanding away. Classical mechanics says this is exactly how the expansion of the universe should work. Just as a stone catapulted from the surface of the earth takes some time to fall back again. 
It's preposterous to say that space has some inherent property pushing against gravity. Gravity just hasn't had long enough yet. And just as the stone eventually returns to the Earth, the Big Crunch theory, or jokingly the Gnab Gnib theory, suggests that when gravity does win this fight, all the matter flung far and wide will recondense into the exact conditions before the Big Bang. And the conservation of energy tells us that this collapse would bring together all the energy the Big Bang once released. Here, in these extreme energy conditions, none of the laws of physics would work as we expect them to. Everything from particle interactions to quantum processes to thermal flow will be totally unpredictable. The Big Crunch theory seemed perfectly reasonable, and so Einstein's cosmological constant remained buried in obscurity until the late 1990s, in which evidence for the gnab gnib theory was sought out. The Supernova Cosmology Project, led by Saul Perlmutter, used a clever trick to observe the universe's expansion. They studied Type 1a supernova, which are unique because they have extremely constant luminosities. Other supernovas can have drastically varying luminosities, but because Type 1a's are only formed from neutron stars at the Chandeskra limit, astronomers know with precise certainty how bright they're expected to be. By comparing how brightly the explosion appeared in our skies with how brightly the Type 1a explosion should shine at source, the astronomers could determine how far from the Earth the explosion took place. This allowed them to calculate the star's age because the light we see here on Earth has to take some time to travel from the explosion to our eyes. Remember, one consequence of special relativity is that the further away an observed object is, the further back in time you're looking. How fast the Type 1a is moving away from the Earth can also be calculated by comparing something called redshift. Redshift is a phenomenon that arises out of the Doppler effect, and that is that when a light source is travelling away from an observer, its wavelength appears to be redshifted, that is, it's become longer and closer to the red end of the spectrum. The more redshifted light from the supernova is, the faster it's travelling away from the Earth. And this allowed them to track the speed of recession for these distant stellar objects. By analysing luminosity and redshift from a whole host of Type 1a supernova, the team produced a shocking conclusion. The further away, and therefore older, the supernova was, the faster it appeared to move away from the Earth. Clearly, this challenged the Big Crunch theory, as it predicted that the outer edges of the universe were accelerating away from the middle, and so would never contract back together. In the catapult analogy, this would be like launching the stone upwards and watching it initially fly away slowly, and then accelerate as it got further away from the Earth. Because it seemed to take place in the dark depths of interstellar space, and also because they had no idea what it was and how it worked, scientists termed the force behind the universe accelerating expansion dark energy, and it dragged the cosmological constant back into the limelight. When Einstein first proposed lambda, he envisioned it as a constant added to his field equation to ensure that the universe remained static. When it became clear, though, that the universe was actually expanding, and actually expanding at an ever-accelerating rate, theoretical physicists tinkered with lambda's value and managed to map the results of the field equation with experimental evidence. This turns out to be a really very elegant solution to the dark energy problem, because it explains why the universe would accelerate. The logic behind that argument is as follows. If the universe is expanding, which it is, there must be more space in it as time goes on. And if there's more space in the universe, there must be more cosmological constant, because it is an inherent property of space. The cosmological constant creates an expansive force. The fact that more of it exists over time must imply that a greater expansive force is being applied. The old mantra of F equals MA tells us that this increased force leads to an acceleration, which is exactly what we see the universe doing. And so, Einstein's biggest blunder formed the backbone of what became the most widely accepted theory on dark energy. But in the modern age, quantum physics is king in the court, 
and any self-respecting theory must pay homage. Scientists are constantly looking for ways to pair classical physics with quantum physics, and many thought that virtual particles could be the solution to marrying dark energy and the cosmological constant. Simply put, empty space is never truly empty. It's a boiling pot of virtual particles which pop into existence as antimatter pairs, for example a positron and an electron. They exist for about 10 to the minus 20 seconds and then annihilate with one another. Even though this does violate the conservation of energy, it does so over a minute time frame and with a minute amount of energy. And so the universe can go into a kind of energy debt in order to create these particles, and it then pays this back when they're annihilated. Max Planck and Paul Dirac lent the term zero-point energy to the idea that empty space actually has an energy associated with it. It's the energy of all the virtual particles that are currently on loan from the energy bank and are yet to annihilate with each other. It was proposed that the cosmological constant came as a result of zero-point energy, and at first this seemed beautifully simple and easy to interpret. Finally, a complete quantum interpretation seemed to be on the table. Unfortunately, the maths didn't quite fit, and that's a bit of an understatement. The value obtained for the zero-point energy was 10 to the 120 times larger than the experimental value of lambda. That's 10 with 120 zeros behind it. Virtual particles were providing way too much energy to be a model of dark energy. Ironically, what was thought to be a theory of everything turned out to be the worst piece of maths in physics. Never before or since has maths reached a conclusion so wildly different from experimental results. Because of this monumental error, other theories of dark energy were put forward. That's the very nature of science. One, called quintessence, describes it as a scalar field, whilst others question whether gravity works, as we know it, on larger objects. However, no matter which theory you subscribe to, a satisfying conclusion on dark energy can't be found. Unless, of course, you think a satisfying conclusion is that we don't know. But no scientist should ever be happy with that. And so, the pursuit of dark energy remains a very exciting field in modern physics. If you've enjoyed this video and want to support my channel on physics and maths, please subscribe. And to take your knowledge of dark energy and other areas of physics further, see the link to my website in the description below. Thank you for watching.